Every arranging in prep for Sunday, so. Becky just found one soon. All right, so there's one left. Who and Terry got it? All right, ask him, shall we see? Yeah, I don't know. You paid one. You paid one. Have a ride home, my friends. I am your ride home. That's right. Instead of Uber, I'm Uber. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, uh, good evening. Good to have you here tonight. Uh, I'm just, uh, let's just catch up, getting our electrical streaming going. Had a little bit of a delay there. But we're ready to go. Uh, let's grab our Bibles. We're going to be going over, actually, you know what? We're going to be going back to the Old Testament here in just a couple of moments. Going back to the book of Genesis, talking about, let me say it, one of my favorite people, one of my favorite stories, uh, one of the best stories in the Bible. Um, you know, there's lots of stories in the Old Testament that they kind of start good, but, you know, they go bad later. You know, David, you love David, but the end of his life's kind of sad, Jacob. We're going to talk about somebody tonight that the story starts bad and ends fantastic. And I love stories like that. So we're going to be over there here in just a couple minutes. Before we get started, Michael Patrick, should I ask you, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Dear Lord, we come before you, thankful for this time that we have together. Pray, Lord, as we go through our studies this evening that you will help us to all be attentive to those things that we learn from your word. We pray that you will always help us to be diligent students of what you have revealed to us, that we might make application of it in our lives and grow in your service, that we might be found to be profitable servants in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So we're talking about unity. What is it that makes unity? And a lot of times what we're talking about are the things that disrupt unity, that uh, uh, that violate <coughs> things that make it hard for us to get along. Talked a couple of weeks ago about grumbling, uh, talked about uh, different things that we're not supposed to do. But we really tried to talk about the things that we're supposed to do. And tonight we're talking about a thing that we're supposed to do that might be one of the most important things we're supposed to do. Uh, maybe after I'd say love one another, but this one is really important. The Apostle Paul was talking to the Colossians in chapter 3 when he was telling them how it was they were to conduct themselves. He said you need to bear with one another. Oh, by the way, what's bear with one another mean? Put up. I like that. Put up with one another. Forgive. Forgive is where he's going with this. And forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against each other. You know, somebody once said that the church is perfectly designed but there's one big flaw, and the big flaw is us. Yeah, yeah. You know, you only have to talk to me about 15 minutes before I say something that's going to bother you, or, you know, it's going to insult you un un unintentionally. You know, you only have to be around each other a little while before something about us uh, does something, or, or works. Maybe something we seriously do to wrong one another. You know, I always wondered what it would be like if, you know, I'd been a part of the church in Jerusalem, and this guy out there was wrecking everything, and he was trying to destroy us and to keep us from coming together. And he actually showed up and arrested some of our members, and some of them never came back. Oh, I'd be angry. Then one day that guy came in, 
And they said, hey, I, I kind of like to be a part of this church now. I've changed. Who am I talking about? Paul. Paul. What would it be like to have Paul sit next to you and say, hey, uh, you're Paul, you're Saul of Tarsus, right? Yeah, you know, my son used to be a Christian here, but you killed him. Could you imagine forgiving somebody like that? But you have to, right? Uh, you absolutely had to. We're going to talk about that tonight. Why do we have to forgive? And especially, why do we have to forgive each other? Well, tonight I want to start off with, let's talk about the best story of forgiveness in the Bible. I guess maybe the best story is Jesus. But <laughs> after that, what's the best story about forgiveness in the Bible? What would you throw out? Oh, I'm glad we all felt the same. We'd all go to Joseph. Let's jump back in our Bibles, back to the book of Genesis, chapter 45. Um, I tell you what, for the sake of time, boy, it'd be great to read this. My hope is that beginning in January, we're going to start a, a series on the book of Genesis. I'm really excited about it. Uh, but we've got a lot of things to think about. It's going to be a, you have to do a lot of reading class ahead of time, so that's uh, that's a difficult thing. But I'm really excited about talking about Genesis, and one of the best parts of Genesis is the story of Joseph. Now, let's start off with Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob. Uh, was he the last son of Jacob? Oh, good. Yeah, he wasn't. Sometimes I mix that up, and I don't even say it, but no, he was, he was not. But what kind of son was he to Jacob? He was the favorite. We love the story of the coat of many colors and, and how he was favored. And, you know, by the way, there's a great lesson there about being a father and not, you know, the Bible talks about don't show favoritism and, and just how bad that hurt Joseph and everybody else, of course. But Joseph's brothers, well, how did they feel about it? They were jealous. They were jealous. They were Bitterly jealous. Now, here's what's interesting. <laughs> these brothers, these weren't kids. Um, these brothers, when we kind of added up, we're told that Joseph is 17 years old, and we kind of add together all these things. These brothers are in their 30s and 40s. So they're not kids when they, well, you tell me, what is it that Joseph's brothers do? I need somebody to kind of remind us of the story. Uh, uh, give us a succinct version. Gregor, do it. Um, in order to get rid of their problem, they were planning on killing him, but ended up faking his death, and then selling him into slavery, bringing his coat with blood on it, and claiming his father that they had been killed by a beast. And then he was sent off to Egypt, where he became a great man. So what happened in Egypt? <laughs> he became a great man. He became Pharaoh's right-hand person in charge of everything. So, of course, we're, we're skipping a big chunk of that, where he was became a slave, and he served really well, and then he goes thrown in prison. It's not his fault. And, he and you know, thing. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, but I appreciate that. Um, no, I was just going to say they were, they, when he, when he would tell them certain things about his dreams and, and interpret them to, to his brothers, they didn't like what he yeah. was saying about it. So, you know, there's another lesson there to say, you know, don't brag to your brothers about the fact that one day they're going to be bound down here, maybe. It's, uh, you know, I always wondered about that, too. Maybe Joseph was, I was a little brother. So I, I, there's something about the, I, you know, kind of moment. Maybe that wasn't who Joseph was, but I, I often wonder about that. But his brothers did something awful. What did they steal from him? They made a couple things. They took his life, his livelihood, his experience. What else? His relationship with his father. You know, I think about that one a lot because I think about the idea that if somebody did this to me and they went and told my father I was dead and I knew my father loved me. I, maybe I can stand that you wronged me, but to hurt my father like that. You know, Jacob, in a way, died. You know, that, that was devastating to him. And boy, I, I'd be bitter about that. They took his life. They took his freedom. They took his relationship with his father. Uh, you know, he gets sold off into slavery. That's his identity. It's a pretty terrible thing that his brothers did. And I really think that it's important for us to kind of weigh in and think about the fact that this was a really, really terrible thing that happened. Now, by the way, we, we could talk about other people that wronged Joseph. Who else wronged Joseph in his life? Potiphar's wife. And let's see Potiphar, too, who didn't believe him. Anyone else? Yeah, the guy in the jail. Who was it? So the baker... <laughs> sort of forgot. Well, yeah, the baker was the butler. And then the butler, the butler forgot all about it. For years. 
So, you know, tell me this. I mean, is that not a, a, a good thing to have grudges about? You know, that person that lied and put me in prison. You know those brothers that sold me into slavery? Oh, I'd be a, I'd be a bitter, bitter guy. But our whole point is there's something remarkable about Joseph. In chapter 41, you read about how it is that Pharaoh has the dream. Uh, Joseph interprets the dream. Pharaoh is amazed. By the way, I think Pharaoh might have been really young because a little later on, Joseph takes on the title father of the Pharaoh. Joseph is in his 40s at this point or uh, late 30s. So to get a title like that seems kind of like maybe Pharaoh was a kid. You know, that, that was not an unusual thing. I've often wondered about that. We don't really know. But the idea is Pharaoh is so excited, he puts, verses 39, 40, 41, he puts Joseph as the prime minister of Egypt. Now, Joseph marries, and Joseph has a couple of kids. And there was something about those kids I had noticed before. Actually, we were in a Bible study, and um, Gary or Grant or somebody pointed this out to me. I never thought about this before. Uh, Joseph has a son, and his son's name is Manasseh. And he makes the statement about this, and I'm reading here in verse 51 of chapter 41. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Manasseh means God causing you to forget. And he says, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Now, this is before he meets his brothers or anything. Uh, all this uh, reconciliation takes place that this happens. Why is that kind of significant? That he names his son, you know, all the problems I had, God's fixed. Why is this kind of significant? What is this kind of telling us about Joseph's demeanor? It's something important that comes down to the idea of how we forgive one. Well, he's, um, I was kind of wondering about two different things. One is he's forgiving. He's forgetting what his brothers did to him, uh, you know. And that kind of thing. But maybe his family was forgotten about him. Mm, that's interesting. You know, to think of it like that, that uh, forget, you know, that he wonders about that. Um, if Joseph can say, oh, go ahead. It's kind of thinking, you know, when your children are born, you move on to something else, yeah. right? You kind of let it go. And I think that maybe that happened with Vanessa when he was, when he was born. Maybe he kind of let go of the past. It's like, okay. This is my focus. I've got a song to raise. Yeah, maybe. yeah. I like it. So it kind of made me look, look at maybe his attitude before that. You know, maybe he was carrying a breath. Maybe, and yeah. At Interesting. At this point, you know, like what she was saying, he had a different role to take on. Yeah. Him, so he laid yeah. out time. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that. It's going to break down. Yeah. Uh, to me, it, it speaks of him having been dwelling on his pain. Um. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he soars, he, the name of the first former sire for God has made me forget all my toil in my father's house, which means, which, which you know, as soon as you said it was all about uh, feeling, the way he was feeling before, the son came, and then the son brought him to, I mean, I'm sure he had a forgiving attitude anyway, we, we see him doing great things, but it looks like Manasseh was that stepping point where I'm done with all that, I'm just moving forward, and this is a great thing. So, so maybe Manasseh is a stepping point. We're not entirely sure if that's, if that's the moment. But the big idea is Manasseh, if nothing else, is reflective. Go ahead. I was just going to say, he's forgetting and forgiving before they apologize. His brothers mm -hmm. apologize and ask for forgiveness. That's the term we always think of, to forgive and forget. You know, the idea of saying, uh, you know, I'm not going to dwell on it any longer. And of course, there's always a question of, well, is that, you know, do we really let go of something if somebody's not sorry or things like that? And the answer is, Joseph did. Joseph is saying by the name of his son, those things are in the past. Teresa? Um, a lot of people at this point, when all these things happened to Joseph, might have kind of blamed God, but uh, there's no indication he ever did that. that he yeah. didn't blame God and, and that maybe his having his son was like, showing that God had not forgotten him. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I've wondered about that. Did jo was Joseph bitter and angry? Now, by the way, uh, I'm going to suggest that it's very possible Joseph was really never bitter. And one of the reasons that I think that is, let's go back to Potiphar's house for a second. When he's a slave at Potiphar's house, how does he handle that? <laughs> he's plotting to escape and get home every time, right? What's he doing? 
he's devoting himself to that service. Um, but you know, of course, when he gets into prison, that's when he starts plotting to escape, right? No, he devotes himself to service. I'm going to suggest that there's a good indication that Joseph's disposition was that he really never held a grudge. And when he has this son, he's saying, oh, everything's good from now on, George. He understood that all these bad things that were happening were done because God was working. Now you're giving us a spoiler, George. We're gonna, we haven't got there yet, but you're right. And Joseph knows something, something really important. <clears throat> he probably knows a couple of things, let's say. But one of the things that he's going to tell his brothers is, I know why this all happened. And that's why it's okay. That's an important idea. Anybody else uh, <clears throat> any other thoughts add to this? So one of the things I want to talk about Joseph, and I want to think about Joseph. Oh, go ahead, Stephen. <clears throat> Um, he never forgot about his dreams. Yeah. And yeah. I have sustained him knowing that that may come true. I've often wondered about uh, if while Joseph is a slave and in prison, if he's not thinking, what did that dream mean? You know, because my life just seems to go from bad to worse. But I've often wondered, maybe he was a man that had complete confidence in what, it, what he had seen in those dreams. So it's interesting for him to wonder about that very thing. It's a very good point. So last question about Joseph first, part one. Um, how is Joseph like Jesus? What, uh, you know, we, I love to talk about things where somebody is a foreshadow or a type person, an antitype. What are, what are the characteristics about Joseph that are like Jesus? And probably the easy one is, what's the big one? Go ahead, George. Well, I'm not sure where you're going with oh. this, but we went to the lessons on forgiveness. Uh, Joseph's forgiveness run with everything that they did. Yeah. And what does Jesus say on the cross? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting that Joseph's words were, what you did, you didn't know what you were doing. You were doing the will of God, and you didn't know it. And Jesus' words on the cross are, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So one of the first things that strikes me is, wow, the mindset of forgiveness is really, really interesting and parallel. What else do we have? Do we anything else? Uh, Joseph came from where and went to what? That's coming up. Where did he come from? He came from son of who? Son of Jacob, son of a rich man. And he instead is turned into what? A servant, a slave. Now, how do we compare that to Jesus? You know, we sing some really neat songs that talk about he left it all for me. You know, uh, uh, he left the glory. Go ahead, Teresa. I was just thinking of the first chapter of John, where it talks about he left heaven to come here and be a man. Yeah, yeah. So the suffering servant, you know, so to lose everything, becoming the suffering servant, that's a lot like Jesus. Now, Jesus, or Joseph, in his terrible suffering, suffered in order to bring about what? For whom? Yeah, for the very people that betrayed him. And I think there's another neat contrast with Jesus, that Jesus suffered terribly to bring salvation for the very people that caused his suffering. And so it's a neat thing to compare Joseph and Jesus. You know, the rabbis uh, would talk about, you know, the Messiah. And one of the interesting names they had of the Messiah, when they would read things like Isaiah 53, and they would talk about the suffering Messiah, and they'd say, well, you know, the victorious Messiah, he's the son of David. But this suffering Messiah, this one that's going to suffer terribly, so everybody gets set free, they would say, he's the son of Joseph. I always thought that was kind of a neat thing, that they would think of Joseph, and they'd say, you know, that, that Messiah, he reminds us of Joseph, <clears throat> who suffered terribly, but then in the end, was elevated above all. So there's a really neat parallel there for us to consider. Go ahead. I have a question. I'm wondering if, <clears throat> because the promise that was given to Abraham was given to Jacob as well, if his sons knew of that <clears throat> promise and that was in the back of his mind. That's an interesting question, uh, Teresa. Teresa, I, oh, I really don't want to spend too much time, but I think there's something interesting about where that promise goes. Because that promise is passed on in each generation. And by the way, it doesn't go to Joseph. Whom does it go to? Actually, it goes to Judah. Yeah, to Judah. That's kind of interesting. Uh, but I wondered about that, too. He says God did this to prepare us a place. Now, some of those promises that indicated 
you know, Abraham was told rather specifically they're going to be taken away, that they'll come back. So I have to wonder. And one of the things I've often wondered, Teresa, is if he understood that, that he understood that while it was good to be there, it wouldn't always be good to be in Egypt. Um, and I, that's a really great question. We won't go any further because I don't have any good answer. So, I like that. One last thing. It's about forgiveness. It's about forgiving brothers. Why is it that when you're wronged by somebody that you're close to, it seems worse? And let's talk about that as our relationship with Christ. My dad used to have a saying. I guess he still has it, but I haven't heard him say that. <laughs> he said, you know, there's nothing meaner than a mean Christian. Now, he didn't mean that Christians are extra mean. He meant that it feels a lot worse when a Christian is doing something mean. That was kind of stuck in my mind, you know. What did that mean? Why is it that it seems like somebody that's close to us, when they wrong us, it seems so much worse? Why is that, Tacho? Could it be they should know better? They should know better. Yeah, you know, of course, we're, we're trusting. We, we assume they would know better, and they don't. Good. I think part of it is our expectations that we assume that they have our best interest in at heart and should have us in the forefront and not yeah. do those things. Yeah, I our mean, expectations it's on our part to think that, but it's I think that's you know when when I feel wrong, oftentimes I take a moment. It's like, well, why do you feel wrong? What were your why were your expectations so high that you should? Yeah, you know, Gregory, it's kind of tough about that. Is the scriptures almost talk like we should have high expectations of each other? Of each other, yes, yeah. but. We're human also, and therefore we need to forget. George and Rebecca. Another way of saying that is to betray our trust. Betrayed our trust. Now, by the way, to betray us is what? To hurt us. But the word betray is extra. You can't betray somebody that you expected them to do it or you didn't have a confidence. But to be betrayed, like Judas betraying Jesus, implies the idea that there was something else that was broken, too. Exactly. So when you love someone and you have a personal relationship with them, you make yourself so vulnerable yeah. to them. And so when they hurt you and you're already so vulnerable, it's, you don't have your defenses up. Right. So in other words, when we expose ourselves, I can think of the idea we let our, sh our shield down, where we open ourselves up to each other. You know, uh, let, me, let me kind of say it like this. You know, what's, what's the best seat in the auditorium? I said it before, do you remember? Which Probably. seat? Yeah, this front row, because this is where we say, hey, we'll pray for one another. You know, it, it takes a lot of courage for somebody to say, hey, I've got a problem. I'm going to come up and ask people to pray for me. Why is that so hard? Well, this is one of the reasons what we're talking about. What happens a lot of times? Because brethren aren't perfect. Betrayal. Yeah, judgment, betrayal, hurt. That in other words, I come up and I say, hey, I've got this terrible problem. And, you know, the next week somebody says, hey, I remember what you said about that problem. I, I don't trust you anymore. That's one of the most hurtful, uh, painful things that we experience with each other is that when we do what the Bible says to do, which is to open up to one another, and then somebody is immature or they hurt us, those are the kind of wrongs that people say, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to trust the brethren again. I'm, and those are, those are important things for us to be thinking about. If we can hurt each other in pretty horrible ways. Because of our closeness. And that's something that we need to appreciate. And Joseph's a great example of brothers where you should have, you know, like, like it says in Proverbs, a brother's born for adversity. You know, a brother's born for adversity. I remember when I was a kid, I always thought that meant brothers were meant to fight. And I tell my mom, the Bible says we're meant to fight. But it means brothers were born for circumstances that are tough like that. That wasn't true for Joseph. So that, that sense of an extra betrayal is what we feel when we hurt each other. And we do hurt each other all the time. You know, we think about all the times we've been hurt. We don't always think about the times we've hurt others. And that's the one I don't like thinking about. We don't know, and that's the reason we don't open up to each other. Yeah, it is the reason we don't open up to each other. And that's a failure on the part of unity. And so one of the things we have to be able to do is learn how Forgive one another for the fact that people aren't going to always live up to that. That's not easy. Paul understood that when he was talking to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians. Moving on to part 2 now. Uh, the Apostle Paul was talking to the Corinthians, and they had had a brother in Christ that had been living in sin. And Paul had told them in 1 Corinthians 5, you've got to put him out, can't be a part of the assembly. But now in 2 Corinthians, Paul's saying he's repented, you need to let him back in. 
You need to, and I like the way he says this, you need to rather forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. There's an important uh, thought here. So my first question is, why does Paul even have to command him? This. Now, now that's kind of a broad question, but I mean, we want to think about this for a minute. Why does Paul have to say, hey, you've got to forgive this person? Why do they have to be told to do this? Well, a couple of, uh, a couple of different thoughts. What have you got, Debbie? Well, like you said before, it's not always, I mean, it's not always natural to just say, okay, you're forgiven, now you're my best friend again. Yeah. It's, there's, um, trust has to be rebuilt but you still have to forgive them and comfort them and treat them like a brother or a sister rather than an outcast. So I love the fact that you use the term, it's not natural. Now, remember, as Christians, we're working against what's natural. What comes naturally is to hold a grudge. An animal holds a grudge. You know, if if you're mean to a dog, he, he might not forget it. Animals hold grudges. But we're supposed to be spiritual, not natural. And that means we have to figure out this process that doesn't come naturally of letting something go when we're wrong, Lord. Yeah, I think one thing to think about here is some of the Christians in Corinth that they have to forgive. And perhaps what they've been doing is limiting God's forgiveness. Well, God's already forgiven, they haven't. All right, all right. So Lamar kind of sees something a little different here, something that I want to explore for a second to say, what if the point is that it's not personal to them? They feel like, well, this guy was wrong, and he's out of here, and that's it. And now when this guy wants to come back, sorry, that's it. And Lamar used an interesting term. He says, what if we're limiting God's forgiveness? Meaning they can repent and be forgiven by God, but we're not so quick to accept that as reasonable. Lamar, why do we not want to always accept that God can forgive somebody easily? Well, it's probably our pride saying we know the person you've heard with us and judging where we don't really understand their thoughts, their motives, their intent, as God said. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a, that's a great point. I got Craig and then Teresa. Uh, you know, as, as, as human beings, we're really good at thinking we know what God thinks. Yeah. And, um, you know, so if I don't have to forgive them, God doesn't have to forgive them. It's just the tiniest thing. It's no big deal. I mean, there's thousands of things we do or say, society will do or say to make it appear that God's all wonderful, where it's just us putting us, putting our own emotions on top of God. Yeah. Nice. We're thinking for God. I like that. Teresa? I think sometimes we don't understand the depth of their shame and guilt. And that's why Paul said to comfort them, because yeah. we don't always realize how deep that is. You know what hurts me about what you said, Teresa, is that I know sometimes <laughs> I think that way. They don't seem very remorseful. That's what I think sometimes. Somebody, Somebody's, uh, well, I'm sorry, you know, Brian, I'm sorry what I did. But you don't sound very remorseful. You know what? I actually balance, I'm ashamed of this. I balance my forgiveness a lot of times on how remorseful somebody might seem to me. You know, I'm, well, you know, or... And you know what's funny? I have betrayed God numerous times. And I'm rather flippant about asking him to forgive me. I just say, God, forgive me. And I just go on with my day. I don't, I don't mourn it. I don't groan about it. I just confess it and move on. And yet when somebody does that to me, I want a little more grief. God doesn't. Let's tell a story here about that Jesus told about a, about a father that was trying to tell his son, you've got to be more forgiving. Two brothers. Who are the brothers? Two brothers, one had sinned and ran off, and he came back, and the other brother didn't want to forgive him. What what wrongs had the younger brother done to the older brother? We don't always think of it in terms like that. We're always thinking of it like, well, you know, he wronged his father. But he wronged his brother, too. How did he wrong his brother? All right, what did he do to his brother, Debbie? Well, they each had a responsibility at home to their father, yeah. and now the older brother had to take up all that responsibility whether it was chores or you know whatever it was he had to take up everything so number one daddy's right when the younger brother left for his product living the older brother had to pick up all the work so right off the top that that would be something great you got something different well and a little, only a little bit here's the when the when the younger son left 
he reduced the resources for the family. He mm -hmm. took his inheritance. He took his inheritance. That's actually worth calling its own. And and so there, you know, there there's that. And then by being gone, he was not there to help his brother and all those things. You know, yeah. 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 He deprived his father of half of his livelihood. So that's something, Teresa. I was thinking along the lines of um, the inheritance that he got. Well, then when he came back, I'm sure his brother thought, oh, great, now he's back and he's going to get even more. And here's what's funny. You know, it sounds like he is going to get it. It sounds like he's right back to being an heir again. So that's a little bit frustrating. What did dad do all the time? You know, it doesn't say it this way. I guess this is a problem I have. I always imagine the dad's at the gate every day. Uh, how would it be like to live with a dad whose son has died, uh, kind of like Jacob? Because what did he say about his son? He said, my son who was dead. Very good. His son was dead. How did that make his father be? To live with a father who grieves for a son who ran away is awful. It's awful. Some of us have done that. To, to have siblings that, that, that broke our parents, and it was an awful thing to see and experience, and you're just, you know, oh, I, you know, you may not be so angry for what they did to you, but to see what they did to your father, you might be really angry. You might be really angry. So why did the dad come to the older brother and say, you've got to forgive him? What's the motivator? What was the dad saying? This is really why it is. You're not doing it, and this is why you're doing it. Well, he says, your brother was dead, now he's alive. What's the point? What's the point that the dad wants the son to see, that we need to see when we forgive each other? What is he missing? It's right here. And he changed his mind, changed his heart, and the way he came back. Yeah, so the son changed everything to come back. He doesn't have love. He's not celebrating. The dad loves that son. And he says, I'm so glad he was dead. He's alive. And the brother's thinking, I'm not so glad. Because he didn't have the same kind of love. That's what this is about. Is that sometimes when, when somebody leaves us, you know, boy, it's been great. You know, here we just started. So we really have, can't even say, you know, us. Somebody's got to be left. But we'll see. It. It's going to happen. You know, I take every lost person. It hurts me horribly. And sometimes I'll think, well, could I have done more? Other times I'll get a little angry and I'll think, you know, why? You know, they, they love and they hurt us. And then they come back and there's almost a sense sometimes of, well, you know, you come back and, you know, you don't seem very sorry. But how does God look at them coming back? Victory. And he says, Brian, you need to think that way too. You need to rejoice when they walk through those doors. And Paul's talking to the Corinthians. He says, that guy's alive again. He was dead before God. He's alive. You need to be happy about that, too. It's a big deal about forgiving people. And forgiving people when they've wronged us as brethren, this is important. Go ahead. Just thinking, you know, we may, we may be okay with the first time. But what about the second time? Yeah. What about the second time? What about the third time? Yeah, it gets a little harder. Yeah. Well, we're repeating it, but then, I don't know, I have to stop and look at my own. Yeah. You know, so, okay, how, you know, how many times has the Lord forgiven me? How many times have my character forgiven me? Yes. You know? Yes. And, um, You've got the answer to how we learn <laughs> to forgive, by the way. How we learn to forgive is to stop a moment and ask about forgiveness. But what, what if the prodigal story's parable hadn't ended there? What if it went on to say, next week, he did it again? And then he came back. And, you know, Peter had a good one. Because Peter was thinking about this. He said, okay, there has to be a limit. And Peter was pretty good. Peter was really generous. Peter thanks seven times. Could you imagine that? And what if the prodigal story went on and he did it seven times in a row? What if we had to hear that story of him leaving seven times, him taking the inheritance and squandering it? That's what we do when we walk away from Christ. We take an inheritance and we squander it. Him going out seven times, you know, Peter was pretty generous to say, seven times is it, right? And what did Jesus say? No, you don't, you don't stop. You don't stop. Why not? Well, you said it. Because that's what God does for us recently. When we hear about somebody getting okay. baptized and having their sins forgiven, we rejoice. We should be just as happy when someone comes back. 
you know what's neat is Jesus will tell us stories like, you know, the, the, the 99 sheep, one goes astray, the, the guy goes out l- looking for that, the, the nine coins, one's lost, and they find it and they tell everybody. And he wants us to say that that's how God feels when somebody's lost and restored. And maybe for us sometimes there's almost a sense of, well, you know, let's see how long this one lasts, you know. Um, here we go again. Yeah, here we go again. And, and maybe... You know, maybe we just don't have the right mind. Let's talk, let's ask a question in a different direction. Let's say this. What is the benefit to forgiveness? Um, there's a lot of ways to, to think of this. So what what is it? Why is it forgiving is so good? Forgiving one another is so good. Can we get God's favor? So right off the top, Tacho was hitting us on our big idea. Our big idea that God says a lot is I forgive you based on how you forgive others. We should stop. We should just dwell on that thought a long time. Number one benefit to forgiveness is that God says, hey, I forgive you in in a characteristic way to the way you forgive others. Number one, that's it. Number two, what else? Teresa? It prevents us from having bitterness and resentment that just lingers and can build into something really terrible. Oh, bitterness. What does the Hebrew writer say about a root of bitterness within us? That, you know, a root is something that's like under the surface. What does the root of bitterness cause? He says it will rise up, and because of it, many will be defiled. Bitterness brings about sin. You know, uh, Abel, uh, Jake, uh, Cain, was bitter over his brother's success and his failure. And God said, you need to deal with that. And you don't think Cain doesn't really need to forgive Abel, because Abel didn't do anything wrong, but he kind of does. We can't. We know what happened. Ryan and then Brent. Just think about it. The parable of the prodigal son. The older brother self-excluded himself from the celebration. I was thinking about the yeah. picture of heaven there. How we can self-exclude ourselves from heaven. Wow, that's neat, Ryan. Brian, I never thought of it that way. But we can exclude ourselves from heaven itself uh, uh, by that attitude. And we can see how, too. Right, I never thought of it. That's a neat point, Brent. Forgiveness brings stability to the thing that's going on if the older brother didn't forgive his younger brother that just makes it more likely his younger brother isn't going to be able to stay with him it's very good very good uh the idea that the younger brother uh needs that and by the way if we jump back i forgot to bring it up at the point paul said to the corinthians if you don't forgive this guy his sorrow is going to eat him alive he's going to be lost so exactly your point there is what paul said so that's a good point Teresa. Go ahead. Go ahead. Not oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, when you when you forgive someone, it's also like taking a load off yourself. Yeah. 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 You know, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a very personal story. So I recently uh, got thrown into a conversation about somebody, not here, but somewhere else, and they had a lot of bitterness against a family member. There's that personal wounding, and they just really held it. And they were depressed, and they were anxious, and they had all of this emotional turmoil, and they were saying, hey, you know, this, this circumstance come up, and, you know, this person wants me to forgive them. What do I do? And, and I thought, are you crazy? Do you want to be depressed? Do you want to be anxious? Do you want to be miserable? Do you want to uh, be burdened? Because, because forgiveness, you know, here is Joseph. And whenever the moment comes, he jumps right into it. And and look at Joseph every time. He jumps right into service. He jumps right into his work. He jumps right into, and he becomes the most important man, uh, one of the most important men in the world, <clears throat> because he, nothing held him down. Manasseh, it's forgotten. It's forgotten. And that's great. Becky, anything to reason? Well, that is pretty much what I was going to say. It's so freeing. When you're holding on to something, it is, and you finally let it go, it's like, I mean, it's like the way of the world is off people. Yeah. It feels so good. Yeah. Forget. <clears throat> oh, uh, well, oh, I want to go farther with that, but I'm going to wait. Uh, Teresa, go ahead. Um, this example of Joseph tells us that we don't have to wait for the other person to ask us for forgiveness. We can forgive them long before that happens. It may not ever happen. Yeah, you know, certainly, uh, and yes, that's that's exactly right. And that's actually the point I wanted us to draw from Joseph, is to say, we are free to let something go, to not be eaten up by it, to not say to ourselves, and by the way, we're going to be careful to say that doesn't mean that they're, you know, before God, they have no guilt. Uh, that's, you know, whether I forgive them or not, if I hold the grudge, it doesn't matter. God's forgiven them 
uh, my holding a grudge isn't going to help them, but it's going to hurt me. But you're exactly right. And the important point is Joseph is the great example for us to say, you know, here's a guy whose success was in large part because of his forgiveness, didn't he? Sometimes someone can do something to hurt us and not realize they do it. Of course. So in that case, we have to be able to forgive them for us to let go of yeah. that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and particularly, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get hurt by somebody and they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't, you know, that, you know, uh, if, uh, I'll pick up Michael. If Michael's pulling out of the parking lot and runs over my foot, oh, Michael, he, might, he doesn't even know, perhaps, you know? Do I go to him and say, Michael, you ran over my foot. <laughs> you know, you better be sorry. Well, he doesn't even know how to be sorry. No, there's there's a lot of things we have to forgive because, as you said, you know, it's it's it, it may not even know. I've offended a lot of people unwittingly. I know I, know I have um, because I've got this mouth. And it does a lot of bad things. And the truth of the matter is, you know, all of us have. And... <laughs> You gotta be ready to forgive for that exact reason. I wanna to, wanna to jump ahead. Actually, I wanna grab this second point and say what what curses come with it. That's easy because let's just reverse everything. Tacho said, we get the grace and favor and forgiveness of God if we forgive. If you don't forgive one another, what? You don't get forgiveness. And here's what's funny: it doesn't matter a lot to them whether you give it or not. It matters a lot whether you get it from God. What else? What else can we say? What do you lose? What do you lose? Peace of mind. I like to think of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. When I think of those things, all of those things are killed when I won't forget. I lose all of that. That's what I want the most. I want peace and joy and patience and kindness and goodness. And it's all strangled if I don't forget. If I'm unwilling to forgive, I lose it all. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And Paul told the and Paul told the Corinthians that guy could lose his soul if you don't forgive. Now I was thinking about that. One of the things I was thinking of is, and that would be on you. <clears throat> Paul might not be saying it outright, but I think there's a sense of that. But a lot of people will be lost if you don't forgive. So that's an important point, Terry. In verse eleven, the way you can see this is that no advantage may be gained over us by Satan. We are not taking our devices. Also, you can say, um, if you don't forgive, that advantage may be gained over us by sin. I've never seen it that way. Second, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. I've never thought of it that way, Terry. That's a really neat way of looking at it. The advantage Satan gains uh, by our absence of forgiveness. That's fantastic. That's a whole sermon, Terry. We'll expect to hear it Sunday. Uh, that's really good, Terry. I really like that. I'm going to skip the next question for the sake of time. Um, I want to kind of wrap up, though, coming back to Joseph, and I want to point out something really neat about what Joseph said. So, so his brothers show up, and you know, you know, oh, we're, you know, he, what has he done? And Joseph says something that to me says Joseph is one of the greatest people in history. Joseph is one of the most important people ever, because Joseph doesn't just say, "Guys, I forgive you." What little extra does he add on to this? I'm getting goosebumps. What does he say, Teresa? Well, it gives him some comfort by saying what you did was basically part of God's plan. Yeah, he says, this was what God wanted. But what's he talking about with forgiveness here? He says, guys, you need to forgive yourself. My brain blows up a little bit when I read that verse. Because... If there's somebody that has a good life, you remember what somebody asked me the other day, you ever wonder what Potiphar felt like whenever Joseph got promoted to the top? Well, if he knew Joseph very well, he probably should have been. Joseph doesn't just say, I forgive you. Joseph says, guys, you need to forgive yourselves. Now, I don't, that, that, that expression really isn't found in the Bible often, right? You probably know that. You're not going to see a lot of times where the Bible says something like, hey, forgive yourself. Here's Joseph. And Joseph says, guys, Forgive yourselves. Let's let's explore that. Oh, we don't have a lot of time, but I really wanted to talk about this. Why is it hard to forgive ourselves? Why do we not like to forgive ourselves sometimes? You know, of course, sometimes there are people that uh, they just don't feel any guilt. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to guess everybody here is motivated in a large part by a lot of guilt, a lot of you know uh, self-reflection that they're 
you know, unforgiving about themselves. Why is it hard to forgive ourselves? Yeah. We don't feel like we deserve it. All right. So number one, and the whole thing uh, tonight, we've been talking about the idea that forgiveness is not a deserved thing, but we're still expecting a deserving for ourselves. So that's a good one. I don't deserve it. I know what I did. We know ourselves. We know ourselves. You know, I was thinking about that. I know what my motivation was for what I did bad. And it was even worse than what I did. And that's hard to let go of, too. I think sometimes it may be that we don't trust that God's going to actually really forgive us for what we do. I agree. I think that there are times where we lack faith. And we think, but I did some pretty bad things. I baptized a guy once, and, uh, you know, I said, oh, you know, we... Uh, uh, he didn't go all the way in there. I said, well, let's, let's do that one more time. He said, yeah. He said, I got a lot of sins. We better do it a few times. <laughs> you know, we say, God, oh, I don't think God can forgive me. You know, this is where we have these marvelous stories of a guy that comes into the church and says, hey, I'm going to join you guys. And they had to deal with the fact that he had killed some of them. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody once said, maybe Paul's thorn in the flesh was being able to forgive himself. I think it's a neat idea. With the burdens that he bore, that's a neat idea. You know we have to work on forgiving ourselves because if we're saying, hey, God says if I confess my sins, you know, he's faithful, he'll cleanse me of all unrighteousness, I'm supposed to believe that to be true myself. Sometimes I can't quite believe that to be true. We are out of time. Now I've got to wrap us up or the kids are going to come out and tear us up. So <laughs> we'll bring this to a conclusion. Um, I'd love to have spent a little more time on this. I really want us to understand how important this is to our unity forgiving each other because we're gonna wrong each other the preacher is going to say things that are just oh why did he say that your brethren are going to say and do things to you that you just "Ah, why did he do that and you've got to let it go you've got to have a heart and mind that says even especially when it's not something significant but uh that says i'm not going to hold this that i'm like joseph i'm going to let it go and i'm going to get the blessings of god for you That's the way we need to approach the idea of why we forgive. So thanks so much for your time tonight and all the good thoughts we have. Really appreciate it. Strike me as a, you know, especially the what if I never have a chance to get that? Songbooks uh, our invitation song is going to be song number 271. Song number 271.
presentation tonight, song number 272. <laughs> Once you've marked your songbooks there, let's go over to song number 589. Song number 589. That's the deal. <laughs> We'll sing both verses of song number five, eight. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You are Desire and I long to worship you. You are the Lord, my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit be. chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my word, acts on them, and I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood occurred, the torrent burst against the house and could not shake it, because it had been well built. But the one who had heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation, and the torrent burst against it. And immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. I also want to read in Matthew this pretty, sim pretty similar story um, about building the house on the rock and building the house on the sand. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been found on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And it fell, and a great was its fall. When Brian was teaching us about that, I, I always, you know, want to act like the, the wise man, and, and everybody should strive to be like the wise man, building the, the house on that, but I, I tend to kind of drift off when I think about that passage in, 
it's probably because I've worked in construction with Junior in his business, so I tend to think of other things besides being a wise man. I tend to think, well, what kind of walls is he putting up? Is he putting up a good foundation? Is he, is, is his foundation strong? Is he using a good nail or, um, or using the right tools even? And, you know, in the shop, you could go to three guys and they could say three different types of screw guns that they like. They might like Makita, they might like Bosch or Festool. I'm a festival guy, but that's not necessarily what I'm meaning. I'm meaning when you build a cabinet, you don't hang a cabinet with glue. You hang a cabinet with a, a nail or a screw or not a rusty nail. You, you look at a rusty nail and you don't, you don't want to use a rusty nail to hang up a cabinet. That's not going to be strong. You want something strong to keep it up. And... Looking at that, I think when I think about all those tools that I use, I kind of think about the same thing with building relationships with God. Wanting to use to surround yourself with the tools that God has given you throughout your life. A couple of those tools that I think about is kind of surrounding myself with people around you. You don't want to have the good people, or but you do want to have good people. You don't want bad people in your life to affect you on how you do. I don't like to call people tools, but they, you can use them for your advantage. They, some people can build you up. When I come to church, uh, especially like a night like tonight, I'm pretty well spent right now. I'm I'm drained from from my dialysis. But when I come in here and I'm I'm kind of dragging my feet a little bit and I go and say hi to Brian or or Junior or, or Becky, man, it kind of kind of lifts my spirits up a little bit. It encourages me to be here with all of you. Um, when I get built up like that, it makes me want to do the same and build you up and do my part. Another example, uh, or another tool that we use often is truth. If you'd like to turn to Proverbs, I'm going to read really quickly there. Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. When you trust in the Lord and you you are truthful and honest, I, I think that's one of the biggest tools uh, that you can use to your advantage that pleases God. And another one is is God's word. God's word provides for those who, who listen and follow. And the God God's word is right in front of us. It's the we have the Bible. It's one of the greatest tools we have that we can use. We just have to be willing to pick it up and learn how to, to use it to our lives, just the same way you would pick up a hammer and and hammer and nail it. If you're here tonight and you're wondering what must I do to be saved, God has given that to us. He's, he's given us the blueprints to literally tell us what to do to be saved. It's just up to us to do that. He, he has told us that we need to hear the gospel. In John chapter 6, John chapter 6, verses 44 through 45. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up. And on the last day it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. We also need to believe, believe that God has forgiven you and that he will forgive, or he will fulfill his promise for you if you believe in him. In uh, that? Uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 24, Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And next you need to repent of your sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 to 33. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And Jesus also said, 
really quickly here over in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. But it doesn't really necessarily <laughs> end there, and you're you're done there. It, it, it's not over. When you you need to continue to remain faithful until death in Revelation 2. Revelation 2 10. Before I read that, it, the same thing goes with if you're a school guy like me, when I read or when I when I work with the school for the first time, I'm not necessarily a pro the first time I use it. I I can use a camera well, but maybe not the second time or the third time. It doesn't make you a pro. And it's the same way with God. It's you don't just stop there when you're baptized, when you're done, you have to continue to remain faithful and work at it and stay strong. So in Revelation 2.10, do not fear what you are about to suffer, and behold, the devil is about to cast into his prison, so that you will be tested, and you have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. So if you're here tonight and you wish to obey the gospel or or you are a brother and sister in need that needs help with prayer or or you need questions answered, we have men that are available to do that. We can help you at this time. And if you have any need, please come forward as we can. Share the place of quiet near to the heart of God. A place where sin and not less. Near to the heart of God, O oh, Jesus, Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, O oh, She's at home. Uh, again, if you want to visit, you just uh, contact in advance. Uh, for traveling, uh, Mark Westfall is on the road, so keep them in prayers, especially as wintertime is here and he travels to some places that have to be interesting to drive in this time of year. Uh, I'll be traveling this weekend, going to Korea for next week, and I'll be back on the 9th. Uh, the wards are traveling, they leave Saturday. They'll be gone three weeks or so, maybe four weeks. And then they'll be back, and uh, Tom and Susie are still down south, and we'll be back in January as well. A reminder for the men, there's a men's study at the Haynes Sunday afternoon. Lunch, or just after lunch, study is at 2. So for the men, if you could uh, join, that would be great. We talked uh, Sunday about a men's meeting. Uh, I think Brian's going to send an email, but we're looking at Saturday the 10th of December. So there'll be an email about that, and we'll try to have a men's meeting on the 10th. 
I did get some feedback on the building location and the decision is we're going to use this facility to cut some of the expenses. So we'll start here someday. I'll send an email tonight just for the group, but look around for those that aren't here or maybe not on email and let's make sure everyone knows where to be at on Sunday. So Sunday at 10 a.m. There'll be a little bit of work here Saturday to get things set up and get ready. I think Greg will uh, help coordinate that, but that's what we're planning to do. <clears throat> for the bank building, we've got a couple of other bids that are coming in for the plumbing and the electric. Uh, a little bit of good news on the electric, at least part of it is already the code. So that'll cut some of the expense that we thought we might have. But we will uh, be getting everything kicked off and started, hopefully in the next week or two. Try to get a little bit of work done before Christmas and then uh, right after Christmas. That's all I have, if you will. Yes, sir. Saturday, study. I will study at the Forest uh, Hills. Forest Hills Park. <laughs> 10 a.m. 10 a.m. So this is the monthly study. If you can join, uh, please do that. Anything else? Okay, let's bow together. We got our Father in heaven. We approach you at this time, dear Father. We're so thankful that we have this midweek service to pause and come together as a group of believers to open your word and study from it. Pray as we study tonight, Father, that we would take the lesson about forgiveness to heart and just consider all the things that we have to be forgiven for. And it would help change our perspective on how we are to forgive others. Thankful for the lessons that are brought, thankful for the studies that we have together. We just pray that all that we do here would glorify your name. We ask, Father, that you be with those who are not here tonight. Pray that you watch over each one and bring them back to us as we gather on Sunday. We also pray that you be with those that are traveling in a way, bring them back safely as well. Be with us all now as we depart from each other and watch over us and keep us safe. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God, our God is an awesome God, our God is an awesome God. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 